urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters, who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. Lot, his wife and daughters, all fled from the terrible destruction of Sodom. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Wicked men were punished by the Lord in the divine judgment of fire. The intense heat consumed the wicked cities and their inhabitants. But Lot's wife looked back toward her beloved Sodom, violating the angel's command and was thus turned into a pillar of salt. Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example of those who afterward would live ungodly. This is a visible example that is mentioned here. Sodom had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abominations before me. Flavius Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, tells us, There are still the remainders of that divine fire, and the traces of the five cities are still to be seen. Popular thought has it that the cities were later covered by the waters of the Dead Sea. But if Josephus could see the cities in his day, then we should be able to view them also. And Josephus may be right if we don't take the locale too literal due to cross-pollination and nationalist place attachment. So one of these cities that I think has a high probability of being Atlantis, the round palace city-state, is Heliopolis, the city of the sun, under modern-day Cairo, which was once referred to as Babylon. But the period of Heliopolis may be the reconstruction of Atlantis, but this time Instead of circular, they resort to rectangular cities. But I am open to the hypothesis that Persia could be seen as Atlantis, as the author J.M. Allen points out in his book Atlantis and the Persian Empire. For the Persians really did build two round palace city-states over a mile in diameter. One was actually flooded by Alexander the Great around 330 BC, diverting the river and breaking the dams, but this was supposedly after Plato had died. So it's not sure if Plato knew about Gore and Darabagur being flooded during the sacking of Persia. But Plato was aware of these round cities that Herodotus and others spoke of. So Plato's Atlantean warning to the Persians in some way came true. So I do think it's very clear that Plato was using the legend of Atlantis as a lesson for Persia but I think Egypt was the original inspiration. So I would categorize Persia as Neo-Atlantis. The question is, did Egypt once have a round palace city-state like Darabagird, or was the original Atlantis rectangular, like we see at Heliopolis? Either way, it seems very clear that Plato's idea of Atlantis applies very well to Egypt and Persia. So why am I showing clips of the Exodus? because I think there's some major confusion between Moses and Abraham. And the Exodus is the Exodus of Atlantis, the final destruction of Atlantis. As Soldiers of Sias said that there were multiple periods of destructions. And I think there were at least two major events, the destruction of the round city of Atlantis and the destruction of the squared cities of the kingdoms of Atlantis. Sodom and Gomorrah could just be another partial historical pastiche telling of exiting Egypt, aka Eden. 
and it's possible the secondary destruction event of the Kingdoms of Atlantis may have also affected smaller city-states near the Dead Sea, for this was considered part of the Egyptian world order. So I do think we should give credit to archaeologist Dr. Stephen Collins on what he's found. Archaeologist Stephen Collins began looking for Sodom in this area. In working on earlier surveys, he came to a site called Tel El Hammam, which was the largest Middle Bronze Age site in the Jordan Valley. To put it into perspective, Collins says, 10 of the city of David would have fit inside Sodom's city walls with room to spare. Excavations began on the site in 2005. Initially, it was found that the site was suddenly destroyed and abandoned, but the date of the destruction seemed to be too late to match the biblical account, as it fit with a date of around 1600 BC. However, in 2013, new evidence came to light after eight seasons of excavations and reading over 40,000 separate vessels. The massive destruction and sudden end of the occupation of the site happened right in the Middle Bronze Age too, correlating with the time period of Abraham. Collins notes the date of the destruction has been confirmed repeatedly from carbon dating testing. Also, after the sudden destruction, the area was uninhabited until the Iron Age. What is interesting is the massive site and the surrounding satellite cities seem to have been suddenly destroyed by fire and an extreme amount of heat. Despite centuries of erosion, vast amounts of ash were found in the layer of the Middle Bronze Age that was associated with the end of the occupation. Pottery that melted in the glass, melted zircon crystals, mud brick structures blown off their foundations, and scorched foundation stones were all found in this layer, showing there was a massive, fiery, catastrophic event that suddenly ended the occupation of the site. Now, it's possible this site was burnt down due to war, but let's say it wasn't. What's interesting is the date of Tel El Haman's destruction is around 1750 to 1650 BC. The current theological consensus for the dating of the Exodus is around 1300 BC. The question is, do we have the wrong Ramses, or are we missing a few, or the date may need to be pushed back? Pharaonic chronology can get very confusing and lost in translation over time. As I point out how Plato's Atlantis of 9,000 years before Solon really was referring to the three seasons of Egypt, putting its date to around 4,000 BC to 3,000 BC, putting it closer to the birth of Athens, and the potential invasion and settlement by early Egyptians giving birth to the Minoans. Just as the dating can get misinterpreted, so too can the location. So I would like to clarify why the location of Atlantis is Egypt a little bit better than what I explained in my last videos. So I'll let Randall Carlson read that to us. Well, yeah, so right here, here's, here's from Plato himself. And there was an island, an island situated in front of the straits, which are by you, called the Pillars of Heracles. The island was larger than Libya and Asia put together and was the way to other islands. And from these, you might pass to the whole of the opposite continent. Wow. Which surrounds the true ocean. For this sea, which is within the straits of Heracles, is only a harbor, having a narrow entrance, but that other is the real sea, and the surrounding land may be most truly called a boundless continent. Wow. Yeah, yeah, right there. Randall Carlson is really taking this literal and not realizing that the true ocean that Plato is inferring is the Mediterranean. It was the early poet, Stasichorus of the mid-6th century BC, who referred to the Mediterranean Sea as the Atlanticoi Pelagae, meaning the Atlantic Sea. 
It's still up for debate if he was referring to the present day Atlantic Ocean, but the fact that the region of Morocco was also called the Atlas Mountain Range infers that it was named after the god Atlas. But these mountains are facing the Mediterranean Sea. That was the perspective of those who were sailing to that coastline. So the Mediterranean also means the Middle Sea. But during Solon's time, ocean and sea was really not distinguished until the Phoenicians started to explore outside the Mediterranean, which had other names as well depending on the culture. It was not universally named. So it's highly likely that Stesichorus was referring to his knowledge of the world at the time, which was limited to the Mediterranean region, so he called it the Atlantic Sea. But over time, people have thought he was referring to the larger ocean. But this is where the historian's fallacy can get in the way. The way to the other islands is the islands within the Aegean Sea. Plato's talking about the Greek islands. The statement about being larger than Libya and Asia combined may also be a mistranslation pointed out by J. Gwynne Griffith's Atlantis in Egypt who argues that it was really referring to in between Asia and Libya and larger than them. And that is Africa. And the pillars are a reference to the Greek islands, the juxtaposition between their world order and the Atlantean world order. But originally they may have been inspired by real pillars. And what pillars would have really inspired the Greeks to adopt this phrase pillars of Hercules. Well, I would think it would be the megalithic obelisks pillars of Egypt, the pillars of the Titans, the Pharaohs, the demigods, aka the Herculeses. Yeah, that would be pretty inspirational for people like Plato to adopt it. Because there's actually a sunken temple port complex called Herculaneum, named after the Greek demigod Hercules. And I bet this sunken port city that was discovered in the early 2000s may have even had obelisk pillars before it was recycled for the building of Alexandria, after its supposed sinking by earthquake liquefaction, for which Plato alludes to as an impassable shoal of mud. Some think that Herculaneum may have been sunken by tsunamis. Herculaneum is the closest you're going to get to Atlantis, for it dates to at least 1200 BC. And we know Egyptian cities could date to over 3000 BC, like the city of Nekhem in southern Egypt, or Hierakonpolis. Most likely established by Ethiopian or Atlantia tribes that followed the Nile and the Red Sea north, later becoming the Nubian pharaohs. The Nubian Kushites may have been the last dynasty to recarve the Sphinx, possibly into a woman's face, and Ethiopian tribes may have been the first to establish Egypt at Nekhem. How far back in time is still up for debate. This fits with Plato's assertion that there were at least 10 kingdoms of Atlantis, or 10 main dynasties that inherited Egypt, going back to Atlantia in southern regions of the Nile. Less than 10% of Herculaneum has been dredged up from the Atlantic Sea. By the way, some scholars believe that Plato actually visited Egypt and many other Greeks. I would also point out that the early settlement of Athens was a round-walled city. For all we know, that may have been a settlement of the Egyptians, which may have also given birth to the Minoans, but eventually developed their own unique identity. I feel like a lot of New Age atheists don't want Atlantis to be associated with the Holy Land region, but historians like Dr. David Miano from the World of Antiquities channel shows us that we need to keep Plato's Atlantis in the perspective of Plato's worldview, not our globalistic perspective as YouTubers like A History Of wants to put Atlantis in Central America, which I used to believe in that hypothesis, but this leads to the historian's fallacy. Now there's one major geological event that we have to consider that ended the Atlantean world order for good. The effects of the Minoan Santorini eruption have been proposed as a likely explanation of the biblical plagues. 
Particularly, it's been suggested that the flooding by the associated tsunamis could explain the first plague and the sea parting. Recent modeling studies have shown that Santorini tsunami effects were negligible in the eastern Nile Delta. Historians and archaeologists had trouble deciding on the year Thera erupted, with dates ranging anywhere from 1645 BC to 1500 BC. Studies of ash deposits on the ocean floor have revealed, however, that when the volcano did blow, it did so with a force dwarfing anything humans had ever seen or have ever seen since. The Tempest Steely being a possible description of the effects of the event in Egypt. Winds would have carried the volcanic ash to Egypt at some point over the summer, and the toxic acids in the volcanic ash would have included the mineral cinnabar, which could have been capable of turning a river a blood red like color. The accumulated acidity in the water would have caused frogs to leap out and search for clean water. Insects would have burrowed eggs in the bodies of dead animals and human survivors, which generated larvae and then adult insects. Then the volcanic ash in the atmosphere would have affected the weather, with acid rain landing on people's skin, which in turn caused boils. The grass would have been contaminated, poisoning the animals that ate it. The humidity from the rain and subsequent hail would have created optimal conditions for locusts to thrive. Volcanic eruptions could also explain several days of darkness, which means nine plagues are accounted for. Amid all this destruction, firstborn children could have been sacrificed out of sheer desperation in hopes that such a meaningful sacrifice would lead their gods to stop punishing them. The plagues occurred due to the volcanic eruption and attracted hordes of locusts, and there was evidence of erratic animal activity due largely to the alteration of air pressure and water conditions. After the complete devastation of Egypt, the Jews were able to get away in spite of the pharaoh's soldiers in hot pursuit. In the Exodus, there's a quotation which goes like this, By day in a pillar of cloud, to lead them the way, and by night a pillar of fire, to give them the light. Exodus 13.21 this state of biblical affairs can easily be related to the volcanic eruption at Santorini. The exodus dates back to 1447 BC, but this is by no means an exact date due to the fact that it's an anthology of stories. Historians have said that they have no clue to the pharaoh who ruled during the era of Moses, which in itself is regarded as the most authentic timing of the story. If the Tempest Steely is to be considered, then a more accurate dating of the event can be related to the pharaoh Amos I, which, by the way, Amos incredibly translates as the brother of Moses. Yet in Egyptian, Mos, Moses, Mez, etc. means son of, and Ah is a common part of Egyptian royal names referring to the moon god Aya. The examination of the mummy of Amos' son appears to have died at the age of 12. In the Bible, the pharaoh loses a son to the plague of the firstborn. We'll of course link the findings below for you to go have a look for yourself, guys. We're not saying that this is the case, and that all the things said here are the truth, but at least keep an open mind to the study of the past. These things, after all, were told after events that happened, and the written accounts could be glorified as origin stories. Now, many people want to say that the crossing was at the Red Sea, but this doesn't seem to make much logical sense. The Red Sea would not have been affected by tsunamis unless it was connected by the canals of the pharaohs, which has been hypothesized to be built by Sennacherib III around 1850 BC, according to Aristotle. The canal may have been about 100 feet wide and 30 feet deep. Since it was connected to the Nile Delta tributaries, it's possible that the tsunami sucked the water back and then returned as a tidal bore like we see with the Chinese Xiangtong River, tidal bore. Whether it was supernaturally caused or naturally or a combination of both is up for theological debate, but it's likely that the only place that they would have fled would have been at the choke point of the Bitter Lake and the Red Sea. Migdol is also a place known to be within the Delta. It is highly unlikely that they went south to the Sinai Peninsula, where another location is referred to as Migdol, but this name was later adopted. The northern part of the canal was farther away and occupied by more soldiers around Serapium. I would like to also point out that the timeline on when Moses visited Mount Sinai may also be incorrect. I lean towards researcher Ralph Ellis who says that Mount Sinai is actually the Great Pyramid. For in Hebrew, Sinai is also referred to as Horeb, which also has been associated with the Garden of Eden entrance, and that is near Giza. But over time, it has become associated with the Sinai Peninsula. But Moses was an Egyptian royal. He would have known which routes to take to get out of Egypt and get up to Israel. 
falling near the Mediterranean coastline is the most realistic route. Sinai also means burning thorn bush, and depending on the context, it can be used to mean to lay waste, be dried up, and to fight. This could be referencing the eruption of Thera, laying waste to the Garden of Eden, leaving only burning thorn bushes as a somber poetic description. So while all this is happening, Abraham and Lot may have also been Egyptian governors of smaller city-states living around the Dead Sea. This was still technically Egyptian territory, but there may have been more fracturing away from Egypt's main territory of the Garden. So the dating of the Thera eruptions around 1600 BC, give or take a margin of error of 100 years or so. This could have been the catalyst of the late Bronze Age collapse, dating to around 1200 BC, but this date may also have to be pushed back by a few hundred years. I'm open to the possibility that there is a margin of error on the dating and there could be some inconsistencies that we have to consider to pushing the dates back. But I'm not willing to jump to the level of Graham Hancock and pushing civilization really far back in time trying to say that Atlantis was sunk by the Younger Dries as the sea level was rising. That's not what Plato was saying. He was referring to that Atlantis was sinking into the plain. Water, not that the sea level was rising slowly over thousands of years. So what's interesting is that the current consensus for the collapse of the Indus Valley civilization dates to around 1700 BC, due to longer drought periods and by so-called Aryan tribes following the Caspian Sea down into Iran and then into the Indus Valley, the third Garden of Eden as I would call it. This could have a connection with the so-called Sea People, which most likely are part of a larger migration waves after the volcanic eruption, causing cooling for a few years, forcing people to go south because the north was too cold and winters were extending into the summer. So what I think we got here is a confusion by different Jewish authors on which stories to categorize as Genesis and which to categorize as the Exodus of Atlantis, if there are two main cataclysms of the region. Sodom and Gomorrah could be echoing of this event, along with the story of Jonah and the whale. Firstly, the Bible is not the source for this myth. The hero emerging from the belly of a fish or dragon is a common motif in mythological narratives across multiple civilizations. The Hindus have a myth in the Somadeva Bhata about a man called Saktideva who was hit by a storm whilst on a boat and a huge fish swallowed him whole and came out unhurt after fishermen caught the fish and cut it open. In Greek mythology, in the labours of Hercules, Hercules was said to have been swallowed by a great fish at a place called Joppa and to have been inside the fish for three days. Here we can see direct similarities in the myth. Joppa is the exact name of the place where the biblical Jonah boarded the boat, trying to flee God and both Hercules and Jonah were in the fish for three days and three nights. There is yet another Greek myth about Arian the musician, who was thrown overboard a ship and was saved by a dolphin who carried him to shore unharmed. The great fish in the Jonah story was likely the Babylonian sea god Deserto, the whale of Dur, who swallowed and gave rebirth to the god Ones otherwise called a dapper, as a water god is an indication also of his solar nature, as his emergence from the sea occurred at sunrise, retiring back to the sea at sunset daily. You'll also note depictions of Ones as a man in the body of a fish, comparable to Jonah in the body of the great fish. It's the same symbology. The Finnish hero Ilmarinen was similarly swallowed by a great fish to be reborn. Swallowing by the fish indicates an initiation rite leading to rebirth. Biblical writers masculinized the image of Jonah, whose name means dove, for the dove was a symbol of female sexuality. 
there were many myths in circulation preceding the biblical story of Jonah, simply different versions of the same myth making its way into the Jewish narrative. So what do these myths represent? These myths have a solar celestial meaning and the characters are personifications of the sun. The fish or sea monster being a personification of the earth swallowing the sun, which appears again after three days on the horizon being the shore or dry land. This symbolism is very common in Polynesian mythology. These heroes remaining for three days and nights inside the fish represent the sun at the winter solstice from December the 22nd to the 25th, with the sun at the lowest point in the earth, the belly of the fish. And on the 25th, it is cast forward and renewed. The theologian Dr. John Watts states, several myths and legend told of a hero being swallowed by a sea monster. Almost all of them have some parallel to Jonah's story. The sun myth pictured the descending sun in the west as being swallowed by a monster, only to reappear in the east. It was known in Persia and in Egypt. Jonah's parallel is that he travels west, is swallowed in the west and returns in the darkness of the fish's belly to appear in the east. But if this myth had any influence on Jonah's author, he has changed it completely. Now it takes place in history with natural creatures in the roles and testifies to the authority of God's word and will over creation and human history. As a Catholic, I agree there is partial esoteric or simply symbolic and psychological or moral lessons of mercy and one's self-awareness of one's attitude and behavior, as pointed out by Jordan B. Peterson. But when you over-symbolize these stories, it dilutes the original historical event that inspired the symbolism. Symbolism alone is not a motivator. Symbolism of the sun rising and being reborn out of darkness like one's soul coming out of evil and into good. It's all poetically nice. But that's all it is. Pretty words. But what basis in reality and practicality does it have? The Egyptians were not worshipping the sun. They were worshipping the hidden one that controls the sun. That is God. The programmer of our world. The sun just happens to be the best symbol, but it isn't the sun that's going to motivate the average person or peasant or prophet to go into a city where they might get skinned alive. These stories have a political motivation and theological, but it's an experience supernatural phenomenon that truly shocks a person into being motivated. It's only later that these symbols and ideas are put on to the historical event. The Jewish stories may be more historically accurate than the Greek stories such as Deucalion's Deluge. This story was far more likely to be inspired by Middle Eastern stories. The partial mythological stories are inspired by actual historical and political motivations. Plato was aware of Deucalion's deluge and other stories coming from the land of Atlantis. Jonah's story may be just another fragment. So I don't think it was a whale. There are no big whales in the eastern Mediterranean. I believe it's far more logical that what Jonah experienced was a supernatural creature, aka an angel. But over time, somehow, angel translated to whales due to the association with the event happening near water. Jonah had a UAP experience over water and may have even been saved by an angel during a storm. If the event actually happened during the time of the Santorini eruption, God in some way saves Jonah from the storm and he's witnessing it and then he rushes back to warn people because he was motivated by him being saved 
and to go into the city. Whether it was Nineveh or the round city of Mari, yes, it was round, and there's a lot of round cities, so Atlantis is a possibility of being round. So it could just be they're saying Nineveh because maybe the Jewish writers were living there at the time and then they associate to Nineveh. Doesn't mean that the story took place there. Okay, this is where politics can get in the way of the story as well, along with over symbolized esoteric ideas. But I wouldn't be surprised if the story of Jonah and the whale is the same story with the Exodus, but by a different person in a different area. But the event triggered multiple stories popping out. And the Jewish authors had to figure out the chronology and maybe they put it too chronological and that may be an issue. I'm trying to stay in the middle when it comes to these legends. I'm not completely rigid in my belief that archaeology has got everything right as Dr. David Miano might lean towards due to his atheistic worldview. So I would like to ask you, Dr. Miano, why is it that in your research as an ancient historian, you see so many references to gods? Could it be that there really are supernatural entities that have affected history? I encourage you to see my videos on UAPs and to review Dr. Michael S. Heiser's research who you are aware of. Now, I'm not too open-minded on extraordinary claims that New Age spiritualist, atheist, conspiratorial community perpetuates. I understand that geopolitics can lead to lost history. For example, if Alexander the Great and the Mongols hadn't destroyed the round palace city-states of Persia and Iraq, we may have had more evidence of this original Atlantis. But it seems clear that the evidence is pointing to people in Africa, after the African human period, migrating to the safety of the Garden of Eden, that is Egypt, to establish the Atlantean world order, which disseminated all the way up to Persia, who may be the last, to inherit this Atlantean world order that inspired Plato and the Jews. This has been Enigma Seeker. Keep seeking those enigmas.